our attendees. Jacob, would you like to lead us in prayer? Um, dear Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the word and learn from all that's written in there. Amen. 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 Now, I was asked, and I just forgot to mention this, if we do have another um, uh, microphone, if it's, there is one, if it's not possible, then I have to take this one off, so that if anybody asks a question, we can get it recorded uh, as well. Um, so later on, if we have a question time, uh, since I think this is probably the only microphone that we have to use, and I've got to pull this one off and run to you and... You get your question and stick it back on again so I can answer. Anyway, the subject that we're doing um, tonight, uh, I've called it the second exodus. Now, the first study which we looked at uh, was to do with um, the vision of the perfection of the church. Uh, what's in the heart of God uh, is to have a glorious, victorious, overcoming church that will bring in a global harvest uh, in the end times. Jesus had said the harvest is the end of the world. Uh, in the second study, we looked at the subject of the appearing of Christ and we targeted specifically the events that happen in the Feast of Tabernacles, specifically on the Day of Atonement, and we saw how this is outlined to us in the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 9, where that whole chapter is 100% specifically about the Day of Atonement, uh, which in the Hebrew is called Yom Kippur, uh, which of course was a very significant day in Israel when they had the two-week war. They'd had the six-day war, and then in 1973, they had the Yom Kippur War. It's the holiest day of the year to the Jews. And that was the day that the Arabic nations um, attacked them. Uh, interestingly, in October the 7th last year, uh, was another very important day called the Great Day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, and it's referred to in how Jesus attended that day um, in uh, the book of uh, John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 7, uh, where Jesus celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. And on that last great day of the feast is when Jesus stood up and publicly revealed himself. Before that, he had only revealed himself in the temple. But this time, on this particular visit we're talking about, uh, it was uh, his public appearance. And, and of course, it cause quite a uh, commotion. So the feasts of Israel are very uh, important in our understanding the spiritual journey, first of all of Israel, and secondly of us, uh, because those things were given as a pattern for those on whom the ends of the world would come. That's what we're told in 1 Corinthians 10 and uh, verse 11. Uh, and one of the questions that I have, just as a bit of a challenge um, to you in the start of um, tonight's study, is are we still babies drinking milk? Uh, you see, the Hebrews had trouble in understanding some of the things that Paul was teaching them. And in Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, he said, by this time you ought to be teachers. Now, they'd been believers in Christ for 20-something years at this stage. They should have grown up. They should be mature. They should be people who really understand the word of God. But now you need someone to teach you again the first principles. You know, they were stuck in John 3.16. Um, they hadn't grown beyond, oh, I got saved, I believe in Jesus, and I'm going to go to heaven. And their life was just revolved around that rather than how we should be changed and transformed into the image of Christ and fulfill the potential that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal within us. He says, you, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of milk 
is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So in other words, Paul was telling them, you're a bunch of babes. You've been Christians for a long time. You should be teachers. You should be training others, but you're still babes. You need milk. You've never grown. And then he goes on and says, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. Talking about the five spiritual senses. Uh, we've got the five natural senses, but also the five spiritual senses. And we need to be exercising those spiritual senses. They weren't given to us just to put in a cupboard and, and say, oh, I've got those five spiritual senses. No, it says, uh, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Our ability to grow into maturity to be able to discern is by putting into practice the principles that he's given to us so that we can learn to discern. But he said, are we still babies drinking milk? So let me ask you this question. Which one are you? <laughs> you know, you, you've, you've grown up and you've still got your baby bottle. You're still drinking um, the milk. Or have you grown in maturity or growing in maturity and have access and eating solid food? Um, you know, the Bible speaks to us and wants us to grow. And in these studies that we're doing, this is what we, we want from you. We want you to study the word of God. We don't just want you to come along and get a, a, an earful of, uh, from a Bible study. We want you to take the material, study the material, have a look and see if it's in the word of God. Because uh, I can make mistakes. You know, that the leadership in this church can make mistakes. Jesus never makes mistakes. And he is the word, the living word. So we need to always go back to him. So when we talk about the second exodus, now this is a term you've probably never heard before. You've heard of the exodus when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. But what's the second exodus? Well, the second exodus is the time when the Lord is going to take his people into that place of protection during the time of the Antichrist. So the second exodus, it's not the rapture. See, a lot of churches wanting to get uh, people out of the Great Tribulation invented this doctrine of a pre-tribulation rapture. It did not exist in the history of the church. It was only around the year 1830 um, that this teaching uh, began um, to develop. And it was actually uh, developed and became a fundamental part of the exclusive Brethren Church. Uh, and from there, it expanded into others. And it became very popular, um, of this, the rapture uh, teaching, very popular you know, through Schofield, uh, Bible, uh, then with Hal Lindsey um, and his book, The Great, Late Great Planet Earth, uh, then the Left Behind series and uh, all the films that came out of that. And, and it just seemed to be something spectacular that all of a sudden uh, the rapture would come and you would see empty, empty clothes all over the place and cars would be crashing because the driver had been raptured, aeroplanes would be crashing because the pilot... Uh, you know, had been, had been raptured. <clears throat> oh, it, it, it sounds very sensational. Uh, unfortunately, it's not in the Bible. Um, and we're going to specifically look at that, the rapture and the second coming of Christ in the, in the next study, the last study um, in this uh, series. So the second exodus is not the rapture. Now, the second exodus is... Because this is the biblical view of how God is going to protect his people during that great tribulation. It's not that he's going to all of a sudden and we're all gone and millions of people disappear from all, all over the earth. No, he's going to take his people out. Just like at the Exodus, the children of Israel who had been uh, in Goshen uh, during the time of the judgments of God coming upon Egypt 
And then God supernaturally brought them out. And in Exodus 19, he says, see how I brought you out on eagle's wings. But I want to tell you that they did not fly. They walked. But it says they came on eagle's wings. Eagle's wings in the Bible speaks of the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. They that wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So the eagle wing power that was first revealed in uh, the book of Exodus. So in here we have the first Exodus uh, from uh, when they came out of Egypt and the journey begins. That's the start of the journey of the people of God out of Egypt, out of that darkness and coming uh, into the fullness of his light. In Exodus 19, verse 4, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Uh, you know, it's, okay, they're on eagle's wings, but they're walking. Um, and that's, that's the thing we need to understand. Eagle's wings doesn't mean to say that we jumped on the back of a whole bunch of eagles and, and we you know we're flying out like uh, you see in some of those... Uh, with those, those films with the dragons, you know, and, and you're flying, flying. No, it's talking about the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And um, I mean, there's a number of verses on that. The, uh, so that was the start of the journey, but the end of the journey, see, they started coming out of Egypt, but we see that, and that was Passover, but we know that the children of Israel had three major feasts that talked about their spiritual journey. Passover, speaking about salvation and deliverance from Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, the Feast of Pentecost, uh, Mount Sinai, where the, the glory of God was being uh, revealed, the Word of God, and uh, prophetically it spoke of the power of the Holy Spirit to equip them for the journey to go to Canaan. The third great feast was the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month. The number seven, speaking of? Perfection, maturity, end times, those sort of things. And the, the book of Revelation is the Feast of Tabernacles being worked out um, in the world. Um, so that's why you can read Passover in the Gospels, Pentecost in the book of Acts, and reference also through the... Uh, the epistles but the feast of tabernacles its fulfillment is in the book of revelation and that's why if we really want to understand the fulfillment of god's plan people in indonesia all the time they said they said uh, how can we understand the book of revelation and i said it's easy and they said what do you mean it's easy i said all you have to do is learn the first 65 books <laughs> And then the 66th one is easy. Because the principles in the book of Revelation are actually laid down throughout those first 65 books. So, uh, you know, it's, you, you, if we study, and this is one of the reasons the church has Bible studies. Because we want people to be able to get into the Word of God, study the Word of God. Because as they study the Word of God, they can grow up into maturity and not just drink milk, but they can start having steak. Um, you know, and gradually move up into a full diet. Because we want people to be strong and healthy, to be overcomers. And it takes, and, and it's a process. Um, I can remember when I first met uh, Annette, uh, it was a little bit embarrassing. I was a young Christian. I'd only been a Christian for a couple of years. And then when I met Annette, she'd been going to night Bible school for several years. She had piles of Bible study notes for all the Bible studies. She'd studied the Feast of Israel, the, the covenants, uh, the tabernacle of Moses, you know, all of these big, heavy subjects. And, and she had some pretty good teachers. And I saw her exams. They had little tests that they did every now and again. You know, A plus, A plus. Sometimes she really messed it up and only got an A minus. But, uh, but she, she studied and she loved the Word of God and she had notebooks and she's writing down notes. You'll even notice today in church, she's always writing down. Um, you know, if, if I go home and I say, look, what did Keith say? Or what did, what did Jeremy say in, uh, in church? And she can, she can pull it out and she can give me the whole sermon. 
um, she, she loves studying the Word of God. And it's that love of the Word of God that will protect us from deception. Yes. It tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, talking about those Christians who were deceived, and it says they were deceived because they did not have a love for the truth. See, we need to love the truth, love the Word of God. It's God's personal love letter to us to show us the pathway to fulfill our potential as believers in Christ and so that we can fulfill the mission. You know, mission impossible. You know, if you choose to accept this mission, uh, you know, and he's given a mission to every one of us. Every one of us has a valuable calling and mission and we need, it doesn't matter if you haven't found it yet, you can still find it. It's still available. That's the greatness of his grace. Well, the end time exodus, the second exodus, is at the end of the journey. And now we find that uh, the church, uh, at the time when the Antichrist is being revealed, so when he gets revealed and is about to take control of the world, that's when the church is taken out on eagle's wings. So just as Pharaoh, he wanted to uh, massacre and get rid of uh, the Jews and Israel back in the beginning of the journey, well, at the end of the journey, well, you know there's three man-childs in the Bible. The first man-child was Moses. And Satan wanted to kill Moses. So he motivated Pharaoh Kill all the first, or all the male children that are being born. You see, he knew that a deliverer was coming, and he wanted the deliverer to be uh, eliminated. So, Satan gets a hold of Pharaoh and says, "Pharaoh, this is what you've got to do." And so Pharaoh obeys, and he goes out to kill all of the male children. The joke was on him, though, because the one child that Satan was after, God put in Pharaoh's house. <laughs> and Moses became the deliverer um, of the people of uh, Israel. He was the first of the, the man-childs in the Bible. The second one is Jesus. And this time, Satan motivates Herod. Go out there and uh, get rid of this man-child. So Herod, he's not going to just get rid of the first, or the, the, man, the male children, he kills all of the children under the age of two in the great slaughter that took place in Bethlehem. And, uh, but the angel of the Lord had spoken to Joseph and Joseph and Mary, uh, they had their exodus. Actually, it's the same, same word in the Greek. Uh, they had their exodus uh, to Egypt. Um, and when they went to Egypt, interestingly, back to the land of Pharaoh, and there um, the deliverer, of mankind from sin was preserved. Then we have a third man child. That's the one in Revelation chapter 12. This time it's not Pharaoh and it's not uh, Herod. Satan comes himself. The great red dragon comes and he's waiting there to devour the child as soon as it's born. But as soon as the, this, this man child, the third man child, uh, is born, He's snatched, snatched away into the presence of God. And Satan's uh, very, very angry. Uh, there's, there's a lot of Australian vernacular that would explain that particular expression. But he was really, really upset. And so he now tries to attack the woman, the woman who is the church, the bride of Christ. He now wants to destroy her, but... He spews out water out of his mouth to catch her and to destroy her. But the earth helps the woman. See, it's on, still on the earth. And the earth helps the woman. And uh, so she is uh, uh, preserved. Well, you think the devil is uh, happy with this. No, he's even more angry. And so now he goes out after the other Christians who hadn't gone all the way on to perfection, who didn't come up to that measuring stick that we looked at uh, a few weeks back, and we looked at that measuring stick, and that measuring stick is Christ. And those who hadn't come to that measure, who hadn't lived in that full commitment um, to, uh, to Christ, not fully allowing the Holy Spirit to change and transform them into the image of Christ, they are now the ones who are being attacked. 
And we are told, and we'll see some verses on that, that these are the ones who are overcome by the Antichrist. They will be slain and beheaded uh, because they still hang on to their faith. They may not have been overcomers, but in the end, they become overcomers uh, because they laid down their lives and did not love their lives even unto the death. Well, in Revelation 12, 14, the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. Now, people have said to me, where's the wilderness? Well, when we get there, I'll tell you. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us uh, where that is. It's going to be a place of God's protection. That's good enough for me. Where she would be taken care of for a time, times and half a time, or three and a half years, out of the serpent's reach. He can't touch her. And this is where verses like Psalm 23 get fulfilled. He prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. We can be sitting down having this wonderful feast and, and Satan can't touch us. We're out of his reach. But we're right here on the earth. And what's more, we are going to witness directly the judgments of God against the Antichrist and the false prophet and uh, all the hordes of wickedness. We're going to be here to see it ourselves. Well, this diagram, I hope this diagram can make a little bit of sense. What I've done, this is that end part uh, of the sixth day. We looked at those six days. This is the end of the sixth day. And as we come to the end of the sixth day, and this is the period of time that we're living in right now, the time of the great apostasy and the time of the great harvest. Now, these, these two things seem mutually contradictive. Uh, but these two things are going to happen. A great apostasy, people turning away from Christ, leaving. I mean, that's why Christianity, which when Australia became a Christian, or when Australia became a nation, Australia, uh, we were declared to be the most Christian nation in the world. 96% of our population were Christian. Um, Today, well, are we 16% maybe? I mean, I'm talking about real Christians, not talking about uh, just people, I mean, even people these days. The surveys, I think it's less than 45% now that actually declare themselves to be Christian. Um, well, the great apostasy in some countries, like in you go to Europe, the number of evangelical Christians in Europe who confess that they are born again, believing in Jesus as their pathway of salvation, is now down to about 3% throughout, throughout Europe. Um, the collapse of Christianity, uh, well, it's the great apostasy. Um, but the Bible, uh, uh, apart from prophesying the great apostasy, which was talked about as the mystery of iniquity um, that was going to happen on the face of the earth. But we also have the mystery of godliness. And God is going to move by his Holy Spirit. Now, back in uh, what uh, Elijah's time, um, how many people were they down to that hadn't bowed their knees to, to Baal? And, and yet out of that came this great revival. And restoration, when you read through the book of Judges, you see one generation, they're on fire for God. They pull down all the enemy's strongholds and they're having revival. The next generation forgets the Lord and they go back to idolatry. Well, these cycles still happen. Um, and I still believe that Australia is the great Southland of the Holy Spirit. I do believe we're going to see a great uh, revival. And as Annette referred to uh, the other Sunday, um, she was talking about that tsunami um, of the gospel that's gone around the world and is, is now coming into the Middle East. And that's why we're seeing Middle Eastern countries. So many people coming to faith um, in Christ. Well, at the end of the great harvest. Now, the great harvest were the four days after Yom Kippur. The four days after the Day of Atonement in the Feast of Tabernacles was the last great harvest. And it was four days. Four days. Why four? Well, four, it's the number of 
north, south, east and west. It's a global. It's, it's, the spirit of God is going to be moving all over the world. The spirit is moving. Now we sing that song and we, you know, we go to Joel and we see this, um, this, uh, this prophecy. This great end time harvest where nations are going to become running into the, to the kingdom of God out of the desperation. I mean, look at the threats that the world is under today, whether it's either from global uh, climate change or those who preach global <laughs> uh, climate change. I mean, I believe that there's global climate change. It happens in regular cycles, and, uh, you know, the, the geologic records uh, show that well. But it's being used as an anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-Gospel uh, rhetoric by uh, a group of people who will be on the first line to sign up for the 666. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't need to make too much of a fuss about it because God's you know, looking after that. And what's more, if we fulfil our destiny to be that victorious, overcoming people of God in the last days that we've been looking at over these last several weeks, then we have nothing to fear because the exodus will happen at the same time that the Antichrist gets revealed. In fact, we have to be taken out of the way so that he can get revealed. Um, you see, Christ in his church, empowered by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we're going on a journey and he's going to take us, take us out. And when that restraining influence... Now, the Bible tells us that we are the salt of the earth. One of the purposes of salt is a preservative. It preserves from rottenness and decay. And this world is rotting, it's in decay. But we are the salt holding it back. But when we are taken out of the way, not taken up into the clouds, but when we're taken out of the way, that restraining influence has been taken, uh, taken away and now evil unrestrained is unleashed on the face of the earth. Uh, we look around at what's happening in the trends of the world and, and, and it's getting pretty bad. But when I look at Isaiah 60 that I refer to here, it says, rise, shine, your light has come. Gross darkness is on the face of the earth. Yeah, when's the light going to come? When's the glory of God going to be revealed in his people? It's going to be revealed in his people when the world is in the greatest darkness and horror and terror and despair. And then the answer from God is going to come. Because God created this world. He died for this world. He loves this world. And there's going to be multitudes that are going to be saved. And that's why he wants you and I to be prepared to have this vision, to have this faith, and to communicate it um, to other uh, people. Then the reign of the Antichrist begins. But the church, the victorious, overcoming church, has been taken into that place of safety in his tabernacles. Well, let's look at some of these scriptures. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means. Because a lot of the Thessalonians thought that the, uh, the Christ had already returned. So that day won't come unless the falling away comes first. Now that's the, uh, what we're just talking about just there a little bit earlier, the, the great apostasy, that falling away. That must happen first. And the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of perdition. Now, there's only two in the Bible who are called the son of perdition. Uh, in the Greek, it's huios hoch apoleos. Only twice it's mentioned. The first one was Judas in John 17, verse 12. You know, one of the 12. One of the closest intimate circle of Christ's followers. But he became a little antichrist. And... He's the one that uh, betrayed Jesus and sold Jesus to be crucified. The second time is in this verse, in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, the Antichrist, where it says the man of sin. That's the same term, the son of perdition. Uh, and these are the only two. So it kind of gives us a glimpse of uh, who the Antichrist could be. 
If you take the example of Judas, one of the intimate, close disciples of Jesus, and then the Antichrist, the one who's going to be revealed in the last day, this son of perdition, this one is probably going to come from out of the church. Wouldn't surprise me if he's a mixture of uh, Jewish and Arab uh, descent. <laughs> um, so that he can bring in Judaism and Islam and Christians and bring them all into one great federation of, of a worldwide uh, religion. But this one who was revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple. Now this is where um, a lot of people make the mistake about the rebuilding of a third temple. They say, oh, there's got to be a third temple built because the Antichrist is going to come into it. Well, the term for the physical structure of the, uh, the temple is the Greek word hieros. But the word here is naos. And naos means the place of God's presence. This is where God dwells. Uh, what was Satan after in his rebellion against God? He said, I will be like God. I will ascend on, on the top of the mountain of the Lord. He wanted to steal the glory of God. He's not interested in a couple of hectares of land um, on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. No. Uh, he, he wants to steal the glory of God. And the glory of God has been put in the church. Not, not in some building uh, in, in Jerusalem. And so he wants to be worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple, the naos of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, the temple, the naos, the place of his presence, we can see in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17, Ephesians 2, 20 to 22. Have a look at these verses. Do you, now the word you here is plural. It's not singular. This is where English sometimes is limited because uh, you don't know whether it's you or is it you. Uh, but here it's plural because we know, we know this from the Greek. Uh, do you not know that you are the temple? Not individually. You. You are living stones built together to be a holy temple in the Lord. If anyone defiles the temple of God... God will destroy him. Now God's jealous uh, for his glory. He's jealous for his people. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So we are the temple um, of the living God. This is what Satan wants to dwell in. He wants to steal <coughs> the glory of God in the church. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Now, here he's talking about how Jews and Gentiles join together to become one new man, one body of Christ. There's not two temples. There's not a Jewish temple and a Gentile temple. No, there's only one temple. There's only one body. There's only one bride of Christ. There's only one head of, uh, of the body. You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, this is talking about the temple, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple, naos, in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So the presence and glory of God is where? In the church, in God's people, not a building. Matthew 24, 1 to 2, when Jesus walked out of the temple for the last time, Jesus had just said to them in uh, Matthew 23, he said, your house, referring to the temple, is left unto you desolate. In other words, it's got no more presence of God in it. It's got no more glory. And they had conducted a coup d'etat to take uh, the house of God, because Jesus in his early ministry says, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. But now Jesus doesn't say, 
my father's house, he says, your house. He's acknowledging they have conducted a coup d'etat. They have taken control of the temple. It is no longer God's house. God's presence is no longer uh, there. Um, and so in, in, in Matthew 23, he says, your house is left to you empty, desolate. And that was confirmed three times. Once when Jesus walked out of the temple, because Jesus is the presence of God. Secondly, uh, at the Passover, when Jesus had died on the cross, the veil was ripped in two from top to bottom, exposing there was no Ark of the Covenant, there was no glory of God. And thirdly, in 70 AD, uh, Titus comes in and, uh, and, and destroys the temple. Not one stone of the temple is left standing upon another. No temple, no glory, no presence, because it's moved. The woman of Samaria actually got an early, uh, 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 let's say, um, bit of knowledge on this because she said to Jesus, you Jews say it, you worship in Jerusalem. We say it's up in these mountains. And Jesus said, woman, it will neither be in Jerusalem. Hear that? Neither will it be in Jerusalem nor in these mountains. So Jesus took it out of the physical realm and he said, but the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And that was unlimited. That was global. Well, 2 Thessalonians 2, 5 to 8. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? This is Paul trying to explain to the Thessalonians uh, who had, had been taught that Jesus had somehow come back and they'd missed it. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness, or the mystery of iniquity in some translations, is already at work. Only the one who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now this is the exodus of, uh, you know, of the Holy Spirit-filled church, the bride of Christ. We are that restraining influence. The church and Christ. Uh, he's the head, we're the body, and we're anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the power that is holding back the Antichrist. But when we're taken out of the way, when we have our exodus out into the wilderness, then there's nothing to restrain him. And he can take over. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now that's at the end of the three and a half year period of the great tribulation. As it says in Revelation 19.20, then the beast, the Antichrist, was captured. This is at the end of... Uh, this great war in Revelation 19, the beast, the Antichrist, was captured, and with him the false prophet uh, who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Now this happens at the end of the three and a half year great tribulation period. So the Antichrist, the false prophet, they're dealt with. But the second exodus happens at the start of that three and a half year period of time. The overcoming glorious church, he won't be able to touch her. Uh, it, it's Daniel 9, 27 says, Then he, Christ, shall confirm a covenant, that's the, the everlasting covenant, with many for one week, seven years. But in the middle of the week, so halfway through the seven years, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. So three and a half years into the ministry of Christ, on the cross, he says it's finished. He had made an end of the law covenant. He made an end of sacrifices and, and offerings. There was now no more pathway to salvation other than through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed upon the cross. But on the wing of abominations will be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation or the end, end times, which is determined to be poured out on the desert, on the un ungodly. Notice in Romans 15, 8, it tells us that the purpose of Christ's coming. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to what? To confirm the promises, to confirm the covenants that were made to the fathers, to Abraham and uh, you know, Isaac and Jacob. Um, Daniel 12, 5 to 9. Daniel's a little bit confused because he knows that there's supposed to be seven years. 
But halfway through the seven years, after three and a half years, Christ was killed. Well, how can he confirm the covenant for seven years if he's dead? He's dead after three and a half years. And so I, Daniel, looked and there stood two others, one on this riverbank and, and another on that riverbank. So he's seen a vision of Jesus with his two witnesses. Jesus is standing above the waters. He's the one that walks on the water. And on either side of him, he's got these two witnesses. And they're asking questions too. And they said, how long shall the fulfilment of these wonders be? I mean, three and a half years is already gone. Uh, what about the rest of the prophecy? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, which held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time and times and half a time, three and a half times, three and a half years. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, so in other words, all of those believers who had gone into that period of the Antichrist have been slain, they've been totally shattered, but they held on to their faith. All these things shall be finished. So Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy will be fulfilled. Well, <laughs> Poor old Daniel. Although I heard, I did not understand. So if you feel that you don't understand, you're in good company with the prophet Daniel. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed. When? Until our day. Until the time um, of the end. So in Revelation 12, just jumping back now, to Revelation 12, 1 to 2, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. So this woman is about to give birth. She's pregnant. Now we, we saw how on, on the Day of Atonement, that was the, the wedding day. That's when the five wise virgins are taken beyond the veil into the most holy place. This is where the appearing of Christ to his church takes place. It's in a, uh, a private wedding ceremony. It's not public. The public appearing of Christ is coming when every eye shall see him. But this was just to those who are looking for him, as we saw in Hebrews 9. Now notice uh, when it here talks about the sun, this sun glory here, uh, Malachi 4.2. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N of righteousness, shall arise with healing in his wings. Matthew 13, 43. Then the righteous, that's you and me, will shine forth as the sun, the S-U-N, in the kingdom of the Father. Matthew 17, 2. This is Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. And his clothes became as white as the light. 1 Corinthians 15, 41 to 42, in the resurrection. So all those who have died in faith, including those who were beheaded by the Antichrist, they will be raised from the dead. And we are told there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It's going to be, well, literally a glorious resurrection filled with the glory of God. Revelation 12, 3 to 5, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail, which we saw in previous studies, his tail, which represents the deception of the false prophet because the T-A-I-L is also the T-A-L-E. The lie. Uh, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. And we saw that. One third are going to become apostate. And he threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Now, we talked about the three man-childs, but this third man-child... Some Bible translators 
put the word male child in capital letters to try and indicate that it's Jesus. But it's not Jesus. It cannot be Jesus because this is in the three and a half years before the second coming of Christ, not 2,000 years um, earlier. Uh, and we find that there are three who are going to rule with a rod of iron. Jesus himself, the overcoming church. It tells us in uh, Revelation chapter 2 that uh, the overcoming church is also going to rule with a rod of iron and their child, the man-child. So father, mother and child all going to have the same uh, authority um, in overcoming and in ruling with a rod of iron. Anyway, the end time exodus, the finishing of the journey, Revelation 12, 14. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for, we've already seen this phrase back in Daniel 12, a time and times and half a time, three and a half years, out of the serpent's reach, out of the serpent's reach. He cannot touch her. She's preserved. But the church was under attack. He couldn't touch her, but he still attacks. In Revelation 12, 15 to 17, the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth, swallowed up the flood and the dragon had spewed out of his mouth and the dragon was enraged with the woman. And so he went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. That's the other Christians that uh, hadn't come to full maturity. Uh, but who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They still believe in Jesus. And in Psalm 91, 4 to 8, we see the glorious thing that's going to happen. I said, we're going to, we're going to see these things with our own eyes. Psalm 91, 4 to 8. A lot of people quote this and they apply it to now. Uh, well, that's okay. Be it unto you according to your faith. But prophetically, this is speaking about what's going to happen at that time, at the end time. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings, these eagles' wings, you will take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, which we'd probably translate today as missiles. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Isn't that comforting? Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. You are going to see the judgments of God that Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, are pouring out on the face of the earth. All kinds of horrors upon that godless reign of uh, the Antichrist, the judgments of God. You've got the, uh, the seven vials of wrath that are going to get, get poured out. You've got the seven thunders that are going to be roaring out. There is going to be great horror on the face of the earth. And of course, they kill the two witnesses at the end, right at the end. And then they have a Christmas party. They start sending gifts to everybody. They say, we killed them, we killed them. But then they got raised from the dead. <laughs> Anyway, Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Revelation 13, 1 to 4, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now here's the Antichrist. And on his horns, ten crowns. Wow. Wow. And on his head's a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the, the, the mouth of a lion. The dragon, Satan, gave him his power. So the Antichrist has the fullness of the power uh, of, of, of Satan. Just like God the Father gave the fullness of his power and authority to Jesus because he's the Antichrist. He's the copycat Christ. And I saw one of his head's as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world, how many people? Everyone, except for those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And all the world marveled and followed the beast, so they worshipped the dragon. The world will become Satan worshippers. But we, the living, overcoming 
church will be in his protection, will be at the, the table of the Lord, the enemy can't touch us, he's going to be spewing things out of us, can't, can't touch us, the earth's going to be helping us. We're, we're going to be having a great feast. This, this is our wedding feast. You can't let the devil interrupt that. You know, this is going to be a great time. Well, the devil is a little bit upset. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for how long? 42 months, three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted him to make war with the saints. That's these ones that, that get beheaded for their faith. Uh, make war with the saints and to overcome them. See, so part of the church is under protection. You can't touch them. But this part of the church, because they hadn't gone on in full obedience to Christ, growing in Christ, they were still drinking from their milk bottles. But they had a quick education. And authority was given the Antichrist over every tribe, tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. They are all Satan worshippers whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I, I want to emphasize this. There's not going to be a revival in the Great Tribulation. A lot of people say, oh, in the Great Tribulation, there's going to be a great... Re no, there's not going to be a great uh, revival. The harvest is finished. That's why the church is taken out. Only those believers who already believed, even if they were a little bit lukewarm, but they hang on to their faith, they are still saved... But there's no new salvations because the whole world will worship Satan. The whole world will receive the, the name, number and mark of the beast. Well, in Revelation 20 verses 4 to 6, I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. This is those, those saints who were overcome. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they, that's including all, all believers of all time, those who were uh, <clears throat> taken out and were alive and remaining till the coming of the Lord, those who have died in faith, uh, we'll talk about that uh, in the next study, and even these ones, these ones who at the start of the Great Tribulation were a little bit soft in their faith, but they woke up pretty quick, got a very quick education. But they had to lose their heads. Whew, better to give your head to Jesus now rather than wait until the Antichrist takes it off you. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's fantastic. This is the first resurrection. Now there is a second resurrection, but that's going to be a thousand years later. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Wow, fantastic. So... We, when we come to the end of that three and a half year period of the reign of the Antichrist, those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, and those who are beheaded, at the first resurrection, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. This is why it can't be a rapture before the tribulation, because the, the rapture happens after the first resurrection. And these people are in the first resurrection who were killed by the Antichrist in that three and a half year period of time. So looking at it as a diagram, you've got the end time exodus um, to the wilderness where we have the three and a half year reign of the Antichrist. But just like the children of Israel in Goshen when the judgments of God were being poured out upon Egypt, the children of Israel were in safety in Goshen. We will be safe in safety under the wings um, of the Almighty. Uh, at the end of the reign of the Antichrist, 
After that three and a half years, you have the first resurrection, the rapture, the second coming, meeting Jesus in the air. But then notice that little diagram underneath there. You've got the Antichrist and, and the false prophet getting cast into the lake of fire. They get thrown in there, right there, at, at the second coming of Christ. For 1,000 years, Satan is going to be kept in a prison in the bottomless pit. Some people have said to me, why didn't he get thrown into the lake of fire too? He started it all. And I said, he's kept. Because in the beginning, God said to Adam and Eve, or to Adam, in the day that you eat, you will die. No man ever lived a thousand years. The oldest was Methuselah. No, 969. Adam, 930. Nobody lived to be a thousand years. But Satan is locked up in prison to add to his torture of seeing all of the believers from all ages now living with Christ in his glory for 1,000 years, which means no sin, no sickness, no death, no ungodliness. No sin, no Satan, no death, uh, no Antichrist, no false prophet. It's going to be a great honeymoon for 1,000 years. That's why Satan is kept there. So he can see it. And that becomes part of his torture. At the end of the 1,000 years is the great white throne judgment. And all of the ungodly. You and I don't have to worry about the great white throne because... Jesus has already gone there ahead of us. He's already dealt with our sins. Um, we're already being changed and transformed to be in his image. But all of the ungodly, they're going to be raised in what's called the second resurrection, which is a resurrection unto death. And then they are going to go through that great white throne judgment and they are going to be cast into the lake of fire as will the devil at the same time. Well, just looking at this again, the first resurrection and rapture, that's going to happen at the end of the Great Tribulation, at the start of the millennium. Then you've got the 1,000 years. You know, Revelation 19, you've got the diagram there of, of, of the rapture. The rapture happens then at the end of the Great Tribulation. And we are taken up to meet the Lord in the air in his coming. And then together with him, we come and return with him and the total annihilation of ungodliness on the face of it and the earth is cleansed of all ungodliness. In Revelation 20, we have the millennium, the 1,000 year reign of Christ and that concludes with the, one, with the great white throne judgment at the end of that 1,000 years. So, that's the last slide for tonight. It's now 1,994 years since the cross and the day of Pentecost, which happened in the year 30 AD. It's now 2024. So uh, the 2,000 years of the age of the Holy Spirit has been going on for 1,994 years, give or take a few years. I'll say plus or minus six to 30 years to be safe. I don't want to predict the day or the hour because I don't know it. Only the Father knows it. But I do know that the day is getting close. And in six years' time, worldwide, the church will be celebrating the 2,000 years of the birth of the church and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we're getting down to that. There's not much time left. And that's why we have to be serious. You know, that's why we have to be fully committed to Christ and following uh, in his uh, his vision, his plan, his program, so that we as uh, his people can fulfill what's on his heart and see the great move of the Spirit that's going to take place in Shepparton, Victoria, Australia, and across the nations. So we don't have much time left. So in that time that we have left, doesn't matter how old we are, because... Just looking around the room, I think we can all last six more years. Maybe not 30, uh, but we have a mission. David, he knew that he wasn't allowed to build the temple at the end. 
but he still collected the materials. And the materials that we collect are the souls of those who do not yet know Jesus. And we put, because they, they are the building um, of God. Well, Lord, we thank you that we can look at this part of your word. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us insight and understanding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We've still got one minute. So, so time for one question. <laughs> um, why, uh, if there's no temple getting built, what temple does the Antichrist set himself up in? The church. He's been taking over the church for decades. Bit by bit, <clears throat> um, he's, he's come in and he's brought his filthy doctrines um, into the church, brought all kinds of uh, pollution, taking control of the church. You have a look at the churches around the world. You know, the churches that were once Bible-believing, God-professing, Jesus-loving churches, who today are not that. You know, they worship uh, Mother Earth. Uh, they uh, worship uh, the whole agenda of uh, transgenderism, uh, LGBTIQA+. Um, and he's bringing all of that. And they, gay pride, you know. You know, bringing all of that, that sort of immorality and free sex, um, total destruction of immorality uh, because the Lord is holy and he who wants to see the Lord must be holy, the Bible says. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So he's bringing all of his filthiness into the house of God, uh, taking control of the house of God. Look how many churches have been closed down Look, Annette and I uh, have been to uh, many churches that have now become Islamic centres. Large churches, cathedrals in, in Manchester, huge cathedral, which is now an is Islamic centre. Another church, uh, St Luke's, um, we, we went into that church and on one side of the entrance inside the door uh, were, um, uh, you could say, the, the Ten Commandments. And also, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. And on this side it says, do the five, uh, the five times of prayer. Uh, go on the Hajj to Mecca. Uh, you know, uh, confess um, Muhammad is the servant or the, the apostle of Allah. Uh, he's coming in and taking over the church. And that's why a lot of Christians who don't really fully understand it, but have been unsettled in the church and they've left the, let's say, the traditional church, and they're meeting in homes in different places because they saw that the church was being so polluted. So that's the temple that he wants to take over. And that's global, not, not just on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. You said you had two questions? Oh, yeah, the other one is, uh, in, it also mentions in, the, in, in Revelation about the two angels that proclaim the eternal gospel. Can you explain that to me? Um, they, they proclaim the eternal gospel. That's <laughs> 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 Yeah. Uh, well, the gospel has two parts to it. One is the good news in your, of salvation. The other part is the judgment of God for those who do not repent. Do you notice that when Jesus uh, preached, John the Baptist preached, they, all be, they always began with the word repent, for the kingdom of God is near. So there is, there is both grace, but the age of grace is coming to an end. Um, and when the age, it's like when um, Noah had, uh, had preached probably for about 40 years, not 120. Uh, it, 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 it didn't take him 120 years to build the ark. Biblically, you can, you, can, you can see it was about 40 years. You only got to look at the ages of his sons to work out and when God came and gave the command to Noah. But when it came to the end, God said to Noah, go into the ark, uh, take all the animals, and God shut the door. And when God shut the door, Noah couldn't get out. <laughs> And the people couldn't get in. Why? The age of grace had finished. But they were still there. They were still there. And that's what's going to happen in the end time. That day of grace, you know, when the, the church is taken out into the wilderness, the door is closed. Would it be fair to say when it comes to the angelic presence that we're talking about, 
we understand the angels are messengers, right? Yes. So there, there's no record of angels actually preaching to people. So they, they're messengers, and that fits this proof of the people, not preaching to people. Then those angels should be putting a banner declaring the things that you're saying. Mm -hmm. The time is finished, the time of grace is over, whatever. It's a message to the world that's got. It, 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 the gospel, it's declaring the time of the gospel is over, but it's not preaching to people. That's mm -hmm. not, does that make sense? Or yeah, but. Why the people but why the yeah. preaching is no more grace. It's yeah, but there's yeah, but there's also the, the the aspect you have all of the believers, the overcoming believers, they're still there, and they're going to be encouraged by uh, by what they hear. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's a great encouragement to all the believers who are still um, alive because they're still there. Um, so. Uh, but it doesn't mean to say that there's going to be new people get saved. In fact, there's not, not one reference that says that there will be more people saved after that time. Yep. Okay, our time is up. I just want to make one comment, and that is on the weekend we had an independent person come and talk to us about a vision. And just marrying together what you were saying about Jesus and how he said, my house shall be a house of prayer. So it's very indicative of the times in which we live in San And he goes into many, many churches and does a similar thing. He talks to them about the vision. 3% was it? I think prayer. Mm -hmm. That's it. 3%. Oh, 97% no prayer. A prayer meeting, I should say. Mm -hmm. No prayer meeting. We don't have prayer meetings in any of the Yep. Even a fortnight. Have a nice, nice final